That portion of scripture is so powerful. The truth contained in it, it is an everlasting truth. I think we could spend half of our lifetime and still not scratch the depth of what Jesus said to his disciples and to us. So this brings me to the message today. We're still following Psalms 119. And my theme has been feeding on manna, God's word. Taken from Psalms 119 verses 97 to verse 104. We are now in the alphabet, Hebrew alphabet of Mem. Mem. I've entitled my message, Godly Wisdom and Changed Hearts. Godly Wisdom and Changed Heart. First I want to read the, the text taken from Psalms 119 verses 97 to verse 104. And then we want to break down this, this section of scripture and follow it step by step. And I pray God will speak to your hearts as he's spoken to my heart from his word. So first I want to read the text. Psalms 119 verse 97 is the Hebrew alphabet of Mem. Listen to how the writer writes. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies. Verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not, aside, I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. <coughs> when you come to this section, just like the last section that we looked at, uh, it seems that the psalmist was building, almost like building a stairway. And each section seems to build another step that we need to follow. Let me begin this way. Remember how he starts in verse 97? Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. You see, in this world, especially in the 21st century, sometimes it seems education has become a very valuable commodity. And sometimes people base all their life on education. And it's true. Without the piece of paper, you just can't get to the top. You just even can't get the job. You may have experience, and you may have been with something at for a long time, but if you don't have that piece of paper to say you have got the education to back it up, you may not get the best job that's available. You see, if you and I could make it to the top college, as we are always told, you would have a good chance to make something of yourself. And in many instances, it has been true. But you know, as our society tries to get educated, and the push for education, it is so strong. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against education. I think education is very good. But sometimes you wonder with the secular education that's being pushed on our children today, 
how beneficial it is. But at the same time, I have noted it has become obviously true that there is little respect for the Word of God in today's educational institution. In fact, many educational institutions make fun if you claim to be a believer, a Christian. Why is that so? Well, it's hard to imagine having been a pastor for some time, Christian parents. Christian parents will have their children into everything else. Then these children have a good biblical teaching. I've had parents who have come to me when they kept their children so busy out of church, out of Sunday school. And when it was all done with, the children chose a very rebellious path. They came back crying and said, what did we do wrong? And it's very obvious. When people are down, you don't want to kick them any harder. It's very painful to see you've invested so much in your child and they've just gone the wrong way. You know, I hear from camp directors, Christian camp directors. A few years back, maybe almost about 15, 16 years back, I remember I was on the board of a camp. There was no problem getting young people to come and serve on the Christian camps to help the younger kids, to teach them, to be with them. Now, sure, they had to go through a little bit of training to be able to do that. But today, Christian camps are really struggling. They cannot find even a handful of young people that are willing to come and serve at the Christian camp. Most of these uh, young people will say, yeah, yeah, we like the church and we like the Christian camp, but we can get more money working away from the camp. And plus they want to build a good resume that when they do go to the uh, schools and colleges, they can show that they worked in a secular uh, places and have got some good references. And I understand that. So we can see that the kingdom of God has begun to suffer. But the biggest thing that I find the problem is, and I say this, and generalization can be very dangerous, but I say it without any fear or shame, we, even those of us who call ourselves Christians, have forgotten that the Bible has left a lasting impact on the world. Yes, one book among thousand other books this one book called the Bible has left a lasting impact on our world. And whether we like it or not, it is still making an impact in places you would never imagine. Charles A. Dana, a newspaper editor, this is what he said, and I quote, Of all the books the most indispensable and the most useful are one, the one whose knowledge is most effective is the Bible. Listen to that. Of all the books, the most indispensable and the most useful, the one whose knowledge is the most effective is the Bible. You know, some other religious traditions would disagree, they would try to say that their book or their holy book has had just as much impact. I would disagree. You may say I'm prejudiced. No, it's more than prejudiced because in my own life I've seen the impact the Bible has had because I did not, wasn't born in a Christian family I came to know the Lord in my late 
young adult youth life. Dr. Odell Shepard, professor of the English uh, College at uh, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, says this, America rests upon four cornerstones, the English Bible, the English language, the common law, and the tradition of liberty. Please hear what uh, this professor has to say. He's the professor of English at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. He says the English Bible, the English language, the common law, and the tradition of liberty. America rests on the four corners. But liberty, language, and the law might have been drawn from the Bible alone. The breath of the prophets was in the sails of the Mayflower. From those beginnings until now, the Bible has been a teacher to our best men, a rebuke to our worst, and a noble companion to us all. I think he had his finger pointing in the right direction. So what has got all that got to do with the passage that's before us today? Well, I begin. First, we want to look at the source of true scholarship, the source of true learning. And then we want to look at the, the source of true sanctity. You see, the first half of this psalm tells us that the Bible is the source of true scholarship. We have first a glorious occupation of the psalmist. A glorious occupation of the psalmist. Verse 97. Listen to how he begins. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. The psalmist has made God's truth. His every day, every moment, daily companion. You know what I notice when the psalmist says this, Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. It is full of sound, common sense. Something that is missing in our society today. Sound, common sense. It's full of sound, common sense. It is filled with wisdom of ages. It tells us how to make marriage work how to raise children, how to be successful in life, how to face tragedy, how to live forever. So when the psalmist says, oh, I love your law, is my meditation all day. Because he has tasted and seen that the word of God puts his life together. So he makes it a glorious occupation of his. And that's what I would say to all of us that we need to make the word of God, the truth of God's word, a glorious occupation of our lives. You see, it's funny that you get, when you come to scripture, there is structure and there is simplicity. You see, even poor, old, ignorant, unlettered Uncle Tom, in Uncle Tom's cabin, he could pick words from the Bible. And the words he picked from the Bible was, So God loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son. You see, we can saturate our minds with the Word of God and yet never exhaust the wealth that is found in it.